After a loss in game one of the candidates tournament, uh, Mikhail Tal had the white pieces here. And uh, Bent Larson was black. So here's Tal trying to even up the score here. 1965 candidates tournament. So we have this Rui Lopez, Knight of Six Castle, and D6. This is known as the Steinitz defense. D4, natural move, Bishop D7. Knight C3, E takes, Knight takes D4. Uh, all I have to say about this is very solid, but a uh, um, uh, black lacks space in the position. And therefore, he follows those principles of trading off, you know, a few pieces to alleviate the cramp position. And uh, he basically, uh, you know, tries to, you know, set up like a fortress type position where he doesn't really take on, you know, too much pawn weakness or any pawn weakness for that matter. Um, Coverages white to overpress and is looking forward to greener pastures in an end game scenario. All right, but... This this uh, type of opening system for black usually takes a lot of patience, especially with a strong player, before you can even begin to have some type of counter chances or chances at winning. All right, you'd be lucky to, to be slightly worse, you know, or right next to equality before you can even think about uh, winning here. Again, a lot of players would adopt this type of strategy against Tao because, you know, he's known for, you know, the aggressive style of play, so a lot of players will try to just, you know, play quiet against him. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So Tao plays this move B3, and uh, he has this idea of putting his bishop on A3. So knight takes D4, queen D4, bishop takes B5, knight takes B5. And there it is, again, the strategy of being cramped. It's black, right? Being cramped and just um, trading off, you know, a set of minor pieces. Okay. Black still it lacks space, but at least it's a little easier for him to maneuver now. Knight d7. And now bishop a3. a6. Knight c3. Bishop f6. Queen d2. Castle and black is not really worried about an 85 and stuff like that because he always has to move f4 in reserve when he needs it. Rook ad1 and this just puts pressure on the uh, black position here. So, how exactly does it put pressure on the position? Well, um, you know, according to the teachings of Nimzovich, where you can out occupy an outpost, for instance, here, knight d5. Um, it's not really the occupation so much, but what it is is that eventually, oops, excuse me, eventually is that the, in this case, black is going to eventually have to play c6 to m move that piece, which creates further weakness. And so that's where the pressure comes, because black, with the knight on d5, black will always have to keep an eye on c6. And eventually, you know, uh, I'm excuse, excuse me, the c7 square, and eventually... In order to move his pieces away from the defense of that square, he will either have to remove the knight on d5 or play, you know, with the piece or play the move c6, which will in turn weaken his pawns. And then you can see in that scenario how the bishop on a3 becomes even stronger. So we have white here, a slight advantage. Because white has the chances. Black is just still trying to, you know, hold, basically. But white has chances. Rook f e1. And now knight to b6. Bishop b2. Queen d7. a4. The idea is a5, just booting, booting that knight out. A5, knight, d7. So this is why the queen moves so that the knight has a place, a good place to go. You know what, the, that knight doesn't want to go on c8 or something like that. So knight, d7. Bishop goes back. So preparing the knight to move without worrying about tactics against b2. So there it is, knight, d5. Bishops are traded off. And so far, so good. There's pressure for uh, white. Here's a good move to know in these positions, F3, which is often a good way to just fortify 
the center here. Larson was playing on f5 here. And Tao just simply played rook e3. Interesting move. Knight f4 was definitely possible here. Just attacking the rook. And say after rook e5, then maybe then move like e takes f5. You know, just interesting uh, continuation here. And then queen c5, check. Excuse me, not queen c4, but queen c5. And then picking up the pawn like that after king f1. Alright. So, sorry about my dog. <clears throat> so... Back to the game. After f5, Tao chose rook e3. After f takes e4, rook c3. So you can see, you know, a lot of Tao's choices are dynamic in nature. Notice how he didn't really go into that position. Not that it was bad, but it was, you know, a little drier, you know? Like, look at this position right here. Excuse me, not that one. Look at this position, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he could have played for some slight advantage at the queen e6 check. Queen f7, you know. But again, you have to know your, yourself in order to, you know, to you know play a certain way. So this is kind of not his cup of tea. He doesn't want to go into a position like this. Now, me on the other hand, I might go into a position like this. I don't mind playing these type of dry looking positions. But instead, he plays the move rook e3. It leaves the pawn. And he's playing more dynamically, and he's playing against the c7 uh, pawn. Knight c5. Now knight f4. E3. He's trying to. He's giving Larson chances to go wrong. Queen d4. Now rook e5. And now he plays b4. You see how he created. How created almost out of nothing like this tactical opportunity. Look where the queen is. The knight is attacked on c5, and uh, the rook is on c3. Brilliant move, and now white has white has an advantage. Again, in contrast, look at the, look at what could have been, right? This kind of Magnus Carlsen-ish type position, you know, like Vladimir Kramnik type position. You know, a little dry, not knocking those players, but this is kind of like something they would have went into, like a Peter Lako, Michael Adams, they would probably went into something like this. Whereas Tao chooses this dynamic option. He sees this whole scenario of attacking his pawn on c7. And next thing you know, after this slight error, you know, here, which is rookie 5, is a mistake. Next thing you know, he has Larson in all types of, of trouble here. He has to play rook f6 here. And here at the b4. And e2. And now rook h. Uh, excuse me, rook e1. And now the star move is queen a4 here. Okay. Because now the queen would be hanging if b takes uh, c5. And it gets very complicated. Rook uh, knight d5, rook f7. Say rook e3, and now knight e6. Okay, and uh, black is barely holding his piece, but after queen d2, let's say rook f5, so rook 1e2. White is still better due to his uh, peace uh, activity here. Say queen c6, for example. But instead, he played rook e5. And then after b4, right, e2, right? It's similar. Rook e1, queen a4. This is what Larson is count counting on here. He's just simply able to play rook c4. 
Now, he plays knight d7. Notice the c-pawn is no longer protected. And then just rook takes c7. Knight f6, queen takes d6. And just like that, Larson's position begins to collapse. Queen a2, h4, knight d5. There's another pin, knight takes. And I think this is what I find most amazing about Tao's games is how the position could be like dead equal. Opponent makes one kind of, you know, like one error. And in, in this case, was uh, rookie five. And then the position just falls apart. Like, like, um, you know, just melted butter. Just boom, boom. It's like boom, 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 boom. And it's over. Um, but that's due to his... There's active style, you know, you have to have that style to kind of, you know, play like that. It reminds me of Adolf Anderson games, player from the 1800s. Um, he used to be in a lot of positions, you know, I've studied a lot of Anderson games. I studied like 60 Adolf Anderson games in detail, like deeply studied them, not just look at them, but deeply annotated them. And I noticed that a lot of Adolf Anderson games, he would be dead lost, but his pieces would be active. Now, he would be in busted positions, but his pieces would be active. So, the opponent would be trying to win. They would make, like, one error, and then the activity of Anderson's pieces would just spring to life. And then it was, like, a combination here, here. And next thing you know, the, the evaluation was flipped uh, upside down. And Tao had that in his style whereby he would play active enough to where if the opponent made one error... He was like one step behind. If you if you slowed up a bit, he was just right. Or he would just run over you, literally. And that's what I see here, and that's what I found very interesting about this game. Needless to say, um, Larson resigned, and Tao had uh, tied the game right up. But uh, yeah, after this this move, f5, uh, rook e3 um, deserves an exclamation mark just for the idea, you know. F takes, and then right here just you know just playing actively you know i love this this uh this continuation he just put so much pressure on larson you know whereby his, his position just collapsed even here he played 96 um, excuse me he played 97 even if he tries 96 knight takes takes the pawn falls on c7 And, you know, and White is winning here also. So, that was a good, you know, nice, strong comeback by Tal. And at this point, he had two games uh, and two decisive results. And now the match uh, was tied up at one apiece. I'll see you on game three.